Welcome back. We're discussing the world's poorest continent, Africa, and how the global economic storm is affecting the people there. Joining me from London is Dr. Dambisa Moyo, who's an economist who argues that aid is hindering the African continent, making the poor poorer and slowing growth in developing countries. And here in Washington, D.C. is Dr. Paul Collier, former uh, advisor to the British government's Commission on Africa and one of the world's leading experts of African economies. Now, we did an instant poll in the live station chat room during our break. Our question was, is foreign aid helping or hurting Africa? And the results were that we had 52% saying that it's hurting and 48%, uh, sorry, 42% saying it helps. So 58% said it hurts, 42 said it helps. Quite close, uh, actually, there. Uh, let's get back to our discussion. And, and Dr. Moyo, there, of course, before the break, we heard uh, Jeffrey Sachs, the economist, uh, saying that uh, it's, it's very easy to say let's, let's cut off aid. But in effect, uh, you know, this is, it, it could be a very cold and perhaps very, uh, very adverse uh, decision to make. Well, um, as it turns out, Professor Sachs taught me as well, and um, I'm a very, I'm very respectful of uh, of uh, what he taught. And uh, you know, I was a bit disappointed to hear his uh, comments with respect to my book, and I, it suggests to me that he perhaps hasn't had an opportunity to really read it. Um, the broader point here is that uh, in the year that Professor Sachs taught me, he was very clear on uh, prescriptions for most emerging economies, such as Russia, Poland, and Bolivia, and most of those um, prescriptions were market-based. However, when it comes to discussing Africa, um, there's a sense that uh, he continues to push a, an aid-dependent model, which is um, something I find of great concern. Um, I think that uh, also related to his point about um, fertilizer and uh, also uh, mosquito nets, I talk about this in the book. I think the important thing to ensure that we have long-term sustainable development jobs and poverty alleviation on the continent, it will be imperative to actually ensure that uh, jobs are created on the continent as opposed to just uh, dumping um, foreign goods um, in, in under the auspices of, of helping the continent. Well, let's see if Samuel in Italy is with us on the phone. Uh, Samuel, are you there on the phone with us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very Hello. much for your patience. Thanks. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello. Yeah, go ahead, Samuel. Good evening. My my question goes to Mrs. Uh, Moyo. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I don't agree in any way with the argument uh, because uh, the aid to Africa countries is no problem, but the problem has been leadership. Not until we begin to have responsible leaders in Africa. Okay, tell no me that's matter what you do, it's, it's not going to work out. Okay. I'm in Nigeria. Okay. For example, my Samuel, Samuel, let me let me get Dr. Moyo to answer that. It's this one argument that's coming from Samuel, perhaps a valid one that uh, aid itself could be fine in, in any prescription if it's if it's handled the right way at the other end, and perhaps that lack of leadership is is really what's at fault. Um, I think it's very difficult to delink uh, leadership and aid in the African context. In some countries, uh, it aid a share of uh, of public expenditure talk is reaching about seventy percent, and. Uh, so I think absolutely leadership is important and it's critical for long-term success of the continent. But uh, the fact that uh, aid tends to be, uh, has, comes with no strings attached and there's no um, meaningful uh, accountability to Africans, I think ultimately means that you have a cycle where you end up with pretty bad or pretty poor leadership. And, uh, you know, historically, this has been the case across the continent. We had an email that came in from Munish Gupta in New Delhi in India. I want to read this out. And Munish wrote in saying, I just returned from Africa. Aid has helped, but not all of it is percolating down. Would you fault those who are giving or taking aid? No. The bottom line is that help is needed and help was given. Uh, and Professor Collier, an email, another email we got here from, uh, from Manchester, which I might put to you from Faisal Dama in uh, Manchester in the UK, says... Western aid is contributed in a way where it seems that the emphasis is not aiding people, but making people aware through the media that a country has provided aid, thus improving its image and standing in the world. It's quite a cynical view, but is it that aid, aid is almost necessary for uh, Western countries and developed countries to say, look, we're doing something? I think there's quite a lot in that, that aid is about us, um, whereas there are other strategies that would be much more effective in helping Africa to prosperity, trade policy, the security policy we talked about, help with governance. I think aid is just for better. It's receiving too much attention. I'm in the in the in the zero percent between the 58 and the 42. I think aid's a bit of a sideshow. Mm. Um, and there's so many more important things we could be doing, but aid looms so large because it's all about how we feel and what we're doing. That really doesn't matter. We should be navigating by what is effective in these countries.
Do you, would you say there is any parallel, just a thought that occurred to me, would you say there's any parallel between the bailouts that are occurring for, for the large corporations in the West that, that are now going begging for money in this economic climate and, and African countries being in a situation where they need to be bailed out? Is there any parallel you can, can, you can see? The, um, well, there's, uh, there's certainly this what economists call moral hazard, which is you, you give them money and then you get very bad behavior. And in a way, that's what Lambiza is pointing to, that aid may have undermined governance. It may have contributed to this bad leadership. Right. Because the way that you get good leaders is where good leaders have to tax their own citizens, citizens are provoked into demanding good government. Right. Um, and that, that menace of taxation is the discipline that forces good governance. Well, let's uh, see. What we've got uh, Mohammed on the line from Algeria. Mohammed, would you like to, to add a question, please? Yes. If the aid is not helping the African people, why do the government of Africa accept the aid? That's my first question to them, Bisa. And secondly, now there is economic crisis everywhere in the world. The leaders of Asia are trying to pull out something among themselves. The European Union are trying to form something. The American government is trying to form something. What is the African government doing to the people? We are here suffering. No any leader is taking care of us and no any African leader that loves the people. Then this are why are the African leader accepting the aid and the aid does not go to the poor people. I travel from Nigeria, Niger, Ghana, Mali, Cameroon, I'm okay. Mohammed, Mohammed, let, let's get an answer from Dr. Moyo here. Um, again, this is something that I address, and one has to only uh, hazard a guess, because I haven't actually interviewed each and every president. But um, the reality is, um, taking aid is easier than uh, a lot of the prescriptions that uh, I, for example, outline in my book. Um, I am, it's not an easier route, but ultimately the route that I'm prescribing is the route to long-term development. Um, I just spent um, a few days in Rwanda, for example, last week, where the government there and leadership there is very focused on uh, trying to find sustainable ways to, to wean itself off of aid and uh, deliver long-term sustainable development and, and poverty alleviation to its people. But the fact of the matter is the government is 70 percent uh, dependent on aid, and they are really focused on trying to get off of aid, but it takes time and it does take a systematic and concerted effort and very often it's much harder it's a much harder route um, to wean yourself off of aid rather than pick up the phone and call uh, multilateral uh, or international donors and ask for another check which right. is why the credit right. crisis I think is going to be a big a big challenge well that's, uh, that's an interesting aspect we'll maybe get on that but let's get uh, Hannah on the line from South Africa Hannah what would you like to ask but I'd like to ask if not, uh, if not only is the aid itself been harmful and that there isn't a single country in the world that has been successful by being supported by aid, but also the continuation of how it's been given and where it's been given. Interesting point. Can you elaborate on this? Yeah. Policy? Actually, I, perhaps I could ask uh, Professor Collier here. This, it's an interesting. Is there any historic record of aid working? I think, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll give you one. Um, aid was invented to reconstruct Europe after the Second World War, and it worked. But it was a minor part of what worked. It, what, uh, aid was provided by America in the Marshall Aid Program, right. but it went hand in hand with a big opening of markets, so it was a big trade policy. America completely reversed its trade policy, completely reversed its security policy. It put over 100,000 troops in Europe for over 40 years, and it completely reversed its attitude to the governance of other countries. Before the Second World War, non-interference. After the Second World War, it sets up institutions to try and help Europe to govern itself better. Could I pick up on something that Mohammed said a moment Please. ago, which I very much agreed with, that he pointed out that elsewhere in the world, the politicians in a region have tended to cooperate, have learned how to work together. And that really hasn't happened as much as it ought to have done in Africa. Europe has learned how to pool its sovereignty in the European community and share common decisions. Uh, and Africa needs that much more than Europe. It's split up into many more countries, each of which is tiny, but the leaders haven't uh, wanted to share power with anybody, either with their own citizens or with their neighbors. I'm going to get a quick, very quick, 30 seconds to go here. Dr. Moyo, if I could get a, a live station question that came in from our chat room. Patrick in the US says, how practical and realistic is it for African countries to transition their economies from raw materials to manufacturing industries in the near future? I literally only can give you about 15 seconds to answer that, but is it realistic? 
challenging but realistic. Um, I'm an optimist and I believe that the continent has a real chance to transition out of the quagmire that it's in. So I'm absolutely, um, I'm on the po side of Paul Collier um, right. in the sense that I think it can be done. Well, Dr. Moyo and uh, Professor Collier, thank you very much for being with us. We end our conversations there. Thank you Thanks very, very much. much. Thank, thank, you. thank you. And thank you for being with us on the next show. Internationally recognized education expert Ken Robinson discusses his belief that funding for education and arts must be a key part of any economic stimulus package. Join us for that. From me and the team, we'll see you next time.